This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With us, we have Richard Fields, John Cameron, and our special guest, Peter Pish. I knew I was going to mess it up. Ah, Pischke. You got it. <laughs> Peter Pischke, he is a host of the Happier Warrior podcast and reporter at the New York Daily News and the Post Millennial. Peter, yep. can you tell us a bit why you're here today? Yeah, great to be with you, all three of you, James, uh, Richard, and John. Uh, I am here to discuss the issue of the opioid overdose crisis, the addiction crisis, and the opioid prohibition and all the issues around it and the CDC's mishandling, epic mishandling of this issue and their just utter lack of care to try to fix the harms and wrongs they've imposed on so many millions of people in the United States. You mean the Take CDC is... from A to Z. Yeah, C- CDC's messed up on two things like that? Wow. I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted. I'd love to hear, hear what you got to say, Peter. Oh, the CDC has a long record of... of uh, making things worse, uh, even the, their short history that they've been around now. Um, well, basically, uh, it's a it's a big topic, but the the basic of it is that in 2009, the Obama FDA wanted to deal with addiction in the United States, and the FDA and public health thought it would be a really cool idea if they made it so people who use OxyContin as their go-to for heroin. It is, isn't exactly like heroin, but you would crush it into powder, mix it with water, and it would be just enough like heroin that a lot of users like that. So they said, well, if we just make it impossible for people to turn the Oxy into this gel-like substance, then people are just going to stop using drugs. That was their assumption. And so they forced Purdue to do it. Purdue did do it, and that is what sparked the overdose part of the opioid crisis because you were taking people who were using um, oxy for th- for their high and you were pushing them on to much more dangerous substances, in particular heroin. And at the same time, out of uh, China and from the southern border, fentanyl came in, which is a very powerful drug, an important drug in the clinical setting, but a very dangerous drug on the black market. And as these two things happened, they kind of uh, crossed each other and fentanyl became the main go to in the supply line. So it's very hard to get clean black market drugs that do not have this. Um, And so to deal with this issue, the media started talking about the overdose crisis. You had documentaries and movies and books, you know, J.D. Vance, Hillbilly Elegy, all over the place. So in 2016, CC said, "Okay, we're going to fix this because we are going to tell we are going to come out with prescribing guidelines on opioids, which the CC had never touched before. It was pain specialists that put together guidelines in public health, not the CDC whose issue is uh, disease and pandemics. And these guidelines were uh, uh, extremely punitive. They made a clearing call that public health, doctors, law enforcement, state legislatures, all the rest, that it was time to embark on a drug war on prescription opioid medication. Now we are five years since then. And the damage of this is huge. The addiction crisis is much worse. Many more people are getting addicted. The overdose crisis has increased by insane measures between 2013 and, uh, no, yeah, 2013 and 2019, there was an increase of fentanyl overdose deaths by 11 fold, an increase of over 1,040%. And at the same time now, millions of uh, innocent patients, law abiding people, people with pain issues, people with cancer, people with complicated diseases, um, in some cases even, especially veterans, in some cases even children. Uh, I've met with several families that they were had children with cancer and they were told that it was just not a safe thing. We don't want to get your kid addicted. (laughs) It's a lot of disturbing stories like that. And the CDC promised us in 2019, they finally did a mea culpa. The AMA got on this issue, the American Medical Association, they put the pressure on. And that was enough to get the CDC to cry uncle. And so at the end of 2019, before coronavirus, they promised they would work and get a new set of guidelines out. They heard the issues being put before them. The meeting was quite profound. I mean, there are people crying at this meeting on the CDC side and the patient advocate side. And it was it was just like people were telling me, I remember clearly from the meeting, and many people, and these are people who were uh, patients or they were like the mom of someone who had a kid that was a chronic pain patient. And they're saying, look, if we can just wait till the CDC 
puts out these new guidelines, then everything's going to be uh, great. We'll be okay. We'll try to hold on till then. And then here's here's where it gets really sad, and this should be familiar as a theme for libertarians. But um, in February this year, they, they came out and they made it very clear they are no longer going to take responsibility for this issue in any way. They have no. They are not seriously going to be doing anything to reform the issue. Um, from what we can tell, it's going to be all the same people that did it the first time. We're not totally certain. But the CDC refuses to tell us who is working on this, and on and on and on. And people are very, very um, concerned about the situation. Um, to give you an idea of how little the CDC cares about this issue, in this meeting where they're going to tell us, okay, here's the things that the, N the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control are working on. They spend literally 10 minutes talking about the opioid crisis and in that they have the overdose crisis and the patient stuff. It, it barely is a blip. And all they tell us is that the opioid work group that was supposed to fix this had only met twice in 2020, and they, they hadn't even chosen the language they were going to use for their organizational documents. It's just like the equivalent of they haven't chosen the color of the drapes. But they, in this same meeting afterwards, they would spend 30 minutes congratulating one another for their handling of the crises, of the overdose crisis and the coronavirus crisis. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rogers. Oh, you're so wonderful. You, you handled this so great. Oh, thank you, Dr. Steven. You're just fantastic. I love how you handled that. This went on for half an hour. And to top it off, to give you an idea of how unserious um, and how irresponsible the CDC has handled this issue, at the end of the meeting, it is by law that if the executive agencies want to put out public policy change, a big regulatory change, they must get input from uh, Americans, the public. Uh, this is the law. And so at these public meetings, it is the law that people are allowed time at the end of the meeting to, if they're in person, to talk or if they want to phone in, that they are allowed to do this. And the CDC, the, the chair of this, did this just incredible game. You wouldn't believe it if you uh, hadn't seen it. And um, in my article, there is a link to video of this. She played this game where she pretended that the people who were watching didn't actually come. And she would say, you know, um, uh, Stephen, Stephen, uh, please, if you're here, unmute your mic. Now, it, it was set up that only their side could unmute. But they were using Zoom and they played this game and they let only four people testify in a 30 minute time. And they mysteriously, they all had medical uh, letters next to their name. And then after that was done, then all the important people left, everyone that actually matters. And then she says, oh, well, now we need to get some comments from the public. And all of a sudden, magically, it works. <laughs> and uh, this behavior, in light of the damage that has been done to uh, families of uh, victims of overdoses, those with addiction problems, patients abandoned, this behavior by the CDC is completely heinous, and there is no excuse for what they've done. There, the stats are coming out every week. We get new stats that show over and over and over again what public health has done, especially the CDC has led on, has caused damage that is beyond the scope to really per, to comprehend, not just the United States, but across the Western world. Uh, the UN is on this. The WHO is on this. Europe is on it. Australia is on it. Canada is on it. They have enabled arguably the worst health crisis in, in the 21st century, at least the first part of it. If we hadn't had coronavirus, that would be the story because they have acted irresponsibly in this issue and uh, reprehensibly will not take responsibility for the mess that they created and they know it. And that is what the article is about. Tell I'm sorry, that was a lot. Yeah, no, tell us, uh, do you have any stories about people who are pain patients, chronic pain patients, who, uh, and what they went through as a result of the machinations of CDC? Oh, all the time. Every day I get new people. Um, and, and I have to be careful because sometimes it burns me out. Uh, very, this happens all the time. Okay, I'll give you an example of someone I know. So one of the people as a patient advocate, her name is Dr. Terry Lewis. She's a wonderful lady. Um, she's, she has a specialist in all kinds of things an adult son who is severely disabled and uh, he has very significant pain issues now she is a doctor okay she is she, she ha he has a clear record she is a respected physician that means nothing they cannot get pain medication every time they do this and they'll go months and months and they'll go through you know many different providers and hospitals and care and do every single thing they can think of and they'll get close and then the can will be kicked once again down the road 
And that is just one example. There are thousands of people that have messaged me over the years since I started reporting on this. Um, they're very common. You have stories of people like I know a veteran. He went to the VA. The VA was the first to try this idea that we would fix this problem by coming down on doctors and, and uh, patients. And he was denied the pain medication. He'd been successfully on it for 20 some years and had led a pretty full life. But they, they decided that they were going to fix it that way. Uh, he became very mobile. His quality of life went way down. He wanted to speak out the issue. And then his mom came down with terrible cancer. And then she was denied medication. Now she is late stage cancer and they're messaging me. They're saying they won't let her have pain medication. They, they only will give her uh, Tylenol 3, which is not what you give late stage patient, I mean, cancer Tylenol patients. Away. Because they're, uh, they're afraid somebody who is, going, who is already terminal is going to get addicted. Is that yes, that? and this is, people say it doesn't happen, but I have literally talked to oh. dozens and dozens of families or patients that their doctors said this to someone who was at, uh, at the end of life. They have said, I, no. you know, I like you, you're in pain, but I can't risk you getting addicted. It is a ridiculous thing to say, but for doctors, they're scared that they have to keep their bound of prescribing below a certain line that continually lowers and lowers as hospital systems, state medical boards try to fix this issue by cutting down prescriptions. So you never quite know where the line is if you're a physician. So you just have to make sure you stay below it so you don't get in trouble. Yeah, so the even, doctors, well, so doctors are not prescribing out of fear that they'll uh, violate an imaginary guideline. That's, uh, so yeah. Doc, yeah, doctors are doctoring based upon bureaucrat regulations, not the needs of the patient. Correct. Yeah, Most and we, definitely. And I can actually I can say that now. I no longer use pain medication simply because it was so hard to get. Well, first it was easy to get. So, so easy to get that they wouldn't even bother to look at my knee because they'll just give you pain medication for a year. Yeah. And then it became impossible to get after the pain. And then so it's, it's, we've had this journey like three times. I swear where you've gone where it's easy to get pain medication to it's hard to get pain medication then to it's easy and hard. And then now we're back to the hard again. And there doesn't seem to be any rationality in the discussion. It's either we either have this completely free system of, of where doctors handle pain medication and it should be that because bureaucrats shouldn't be dealing with this and there are issues that will come up over prescribing issues people will have, will have will get addicted but if you're addicted and seeing a doctor you at least have a chance to get unaddicted you have help there when you when you go through it if your drug dealer down the street is the one selling your drugs he's got no interest in getting you off and yeah. so we, we've we've literally done the exact same thing we did with the regular drug wars. We've made it worse by crime and punishment instead of saying, hey, you know, maybe we should just help these people who actually get addicted and then kind of leave everybody else alone. I have a, you are, I have a couple you are of questions for you, Peter. When, when you're oh, done responding to James, I'll ask you a couple of questions. You are absolutely right that you, you recognize what happened. If you remember in the 70s, there was starting a movement to try to reform health care, particularly on the issue that about, you know, the top three issues that kill people in the United States are medical errors. And it had, hasn't changed much, but there were efforts trying to reform the problems in medicine in the 70s and 80s. And then they discovered the opioid phobia that had ruled most of the 20th century that was really started by the prohibitionists, like for alcohol, those guys, the temperance movement, they had applied it as well to opioids. It, it's complicated but we'll we'll do that um and so in the 90s fifth vital sign comes out and that starts with the va but the other uh agencies come on board and that's the idea that we're going to treat pain as important as taking someone's blood pressure but this is an important stat it tells pe people we're telling doctors that something is wrong here and there was pressure to have fully effective pain treatment and that was that was the overslide that was we swung from very difficult to get opioids to like crazy easy to get them. And now we've swung back the other way. And uh, it, it, it's not that there wasn't addiction problems or over prescribing, particularly in places like Appalachia, Western Ohio, Western Industrial Ohio, there were prescribing issues, but the people that were the worst at doing this, the prescribers doing this, were already breaking the law. They were ignoring the laws regarding prescribing these pill mills. So there were definitely problems. I mean, the Purdue and the Sacklers, they were engaging in ethical, unethical marketing techniques, but not illegal techniques because what they were doing was virtually what every other pharmaceutical company does in the country with their pharmaceuticals. But there were 
issues that need addressed. But instead of trying to come to a moderate position where both groups are taken care of, they pitted one against the other and the media helped them do it. And we've, we've learned over the five years since this, was, this really got going, that doesn't work because doing it, this method is just, and it's harming both populations. So the needs of people who have addiction issues and the needs of people who have pain issues, really their needs are very similar and we should be able to help both, but that is just not an option right now. Okay. Also, Don, you have some questions. Yeah, um, so first question. Uh, for, first, I have to say one size fits none, because I say that every single show. Uh, is any, any kind of top-down driven model, uh, you know, we see it with the panic pandemic and we're, we've seen it with the opioid crisis. Um, so, you know, it's again a government example. Is it, do you think, because it looks like the unintended consequence of this, if you step back from it and had no moral compass, you would look at this and say that the goal of the CDC is to enrich drug dealers and make sure cops are fully employed. You would, you would look at the, the outcome and all the prohibitions that, that were set up and your only conclusion as to the driving principle for this project would be that we want to make drug dealers rich and keep cops fully employed. Do you think that at some level that is someone's actual goal? Or do you think these people are actually so stupid that they couldn't predict these unintended consequences? There were many people who predicted this would happen. There were many meetings about this and the other organizations, agencies, and people that tried to speak out about it. Many of them were pushed out after this, but there's a famous meeting in 2015 with the AHRQ when these guidelines are being considered for the first time. It's unfortunate. It's not that, it, for one, it's complicated. You can definitely see issues with public health and coronavirus in the sense that bad policies will happen when you're doing with something new. And public health's inability to untangle themselves from the bad policies is that the incentive structures are out of whack. And the problem is that there is an incentive in our institutions today to not take responsibility for the screw ups. There's no win. Okay, The NCIPC, they're the people who then got put in charge of the parent organization, technically the work group. They do not, I mean, there's no win here. So if they admit that the, the CC screws up, people are going to get fired. They're going to have the media on their backs. They're going to be in a lot of trouble. It is so much easier just to ignore it all and just to keep going with what you're doing because, because there's no reward from doing what's right here. There's no reward for fixing it. Okay. So no one, no one is willing to, to make, make the right decision, the risky decision. Because the incentive structures are all wrong. I mean, you see the media, you see this problem all over the place. Um, things that encourage people to do the right thing are kind of broken. Can I can I ask a question? So, how how what if you what's the number of increases of uh, overdoses? Just throw a number out. It doesn't have to be perfect. Based upon this uh, bad policy, can you throw out a number? What what? Yeah. Yeah, is it a hundred yeah. thousand? Is it two hundred thousand? Is it fifty thousand? Is it a million? What 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 is the number you guys talk about when you're talking? About this? The accurate statistic, um, uh, we actually have an update on, uh, is eighty thousand. We know at least for twenty nineteen, that's how many people died. It is an increase over the previous year. There are um, new studies suggesting it might actually be ninety thousand pre coronavirus. Coronavirus is only made it much much worse because people are stuck in their homes people with mental health issues have more struggles so if you have an addiction problem you're more likely to relapse um and of course pain patients the da um there's this fan freaking tastic stat that my friend pat anson who runs pain news network they put out a document uh last month and it, it's like this is what we're doing this year this is what happened last year and their own document suggests now that about 68 percent of the people who, who give a reason for why they're doing uh, illegal drugs when they are asked is that their main concern is getting pain treatment. So it is fair to say the evidence suggests that, that making it possible for law-abiding normal people to access pain medication has actually pushed a whole lot of people to using illegal drugs. I've personally had that in many occasions. It is very difficult to convince a abandoned pain patient or a family member to not go on the heroin because I look, I try to tell them if it's got fentanyl and you, you're not around or able to get them to the hospital, you could be in big trouble. But the, the pain and the issues are there, they're like, screw it. 
we're going to do it anyways. Uh, and, and how dare you for questioning this? So it's a mess. It's so a giant mess. off, we're looking at a couple people getting fired. I think they should be shot myself, but let's say they get fired versus you're throwing around nearly 100,000 additional deaths. You save 90. So we've got some uh, bulletproof bureaucrats who screwed up, who won't are worried about losing their their jobs and having egg on their face. And you've got 80,000 dead people. So, you know, this is what makes me a libertarian right here. But frankly, uh, if it were for uh, nothing uh, else, this should make you a libertarian. Let's take that a step further. What is the libertarian solution and what's a practical way of implementing it? This is a very libertarian issue. Uh, before I started reporting on this, I was technically a conservative. I'm much more libertarian now, to be honest. Um, what would be the solution? The solution for this is almost, it's similar to the solution of COVID. We are trying to fix these issues in medicine and science by taking an approach that it, when you are a patient and you come to them, they want you to fit in their box. You have to fit your needs in their definitions and their little box. You know, you have to put the, the, uh, the square block in the round box. hole yeah. that, that that's societal medicine that's trying to determine medicine from the top-down perspective okay you got a knowledge problem hayek all that the solution for many of these issues <laughs> is to return to individualized care so instead of you trying to fit to the comfort of the physician of the system they are looking at your individual needs and who you really are and then can help you i mean that that's how it should be if you're you have addiction issues they should be able to work with you and help you get the things that you need or best able to if you're a cancer patient pain patient again you have specific needs it shouldn't matter what you john on the other side of the country from me need for your health care versus what i need for my health care but when we do the societal top-down ways to look at medicine and science concerns like that go to the wayside and uh if libertarians have been have been the ones that are most open to this story first particularly like reason mag and they understand the importance of not letting our desires to fix society override the rights of the individual. Well, I think that's part of the problem is, is that some of these problems actually you can't fix. You can just make better. And that's one of these discussions I had, you know, on my campaign recently for assembly was it's you know, there's some of these problems you don't have. There's no good solutions to things like, you know, CPS, to issues like, you know, or prescription drug problems. There's actually no real good solution. What there are is ways to make it a little bit better and to continually make it a little bit better and over time things become a little bit better because there is no fix you're always going to have people that get addicted you're always going to have people that fall through the cracks but what you can do is you can i'll, I'll give you this, <laughs> but what you can do is you can acknowledge and not overreact to these problems i think we over our overreaction causes as many problems all right john you about blew your gasket over there so well, well no i'm just i'm just i think there's there there's there's a difference between a a problem and a condition a condition is something you throw all the energy money capital smart you have at and you can't change it and there's a problem which can be fixed by those things by labor and brilliance and capital and all the rest of that but I think, um, you know, if if people could go to a liquor store, for example, and it was uh, an opioid store, and on, you know, on all the bottles and everything, that, that there was these nice clean needles that they could get, you know, like six free with every six pack of heroin they get or whatever. And the the uh, the the uh, the drugs they could get were certified by an independent laboratory to be 99.999, Six Sigma pure, which you can't do, but everybody throws that word around. Then, you know, the, the problem, uh, and if they're virtually free, which they would be if they're in the liquor store, I mean, compared to what they are when you buy it from. So then what you have is, is I'm not saying it's a perfect solution because it's like you're right, it's condition. You have people making individual choices. You're not going to sell heroin to babies. You don't sell liquor to babies. You don't sell cigarettes to babies. Nobody in the right mind does. But you let people manage their pain. You know, if it takes fentanyl, they can buy fentanyl. You know, you you throw doctors into the loop and make this stuff outrageously expensive. Uh, you make it unavailable to people who can't get health care. And then you uh, create the little shoehorn that the socialists put into the system to create socialized medicine so you can give these people care. 
And I would rather see people, uh, 20,000 new people, overdose on good stuff they bought than the 90,000 people who die and the people who are in chronic and horrible pain. So, you know, I think that the, the closer to a libertarian solution we can get, the better. It flies in the face of probably somebody who's a former conservative. But uh, now what you have is, you know, whatever number is being reported is being grossly underreported. And, and, and chronic pain is as debilitating as just about the worst disease. Chronic pain erases people's ability to sleep, to have a relationship, to work, to perform labor, to be a part of society. And right now we're not managing that. All right, I'm off my I'm off my high horse now. I'm off my shit. Yeah, uh, you want me to answer some of that? Sure. sure. Okay, we've got about so two minutes. So just okay, to let you know. so, you, so you got two points definitely right there. Chronic pain, the problem in our society, and this is a problem you see more on the right than the left, but sometimes on the left, is this idea that if people would just tough it out, then they would be better. Pain is just in your brain, right? This is not scientifically accurate. We have known for a long time that un serious untreated pain can kill you. It can significantly raise your chance for heart attacks, significantly raise your chance for a stroke. It raises many of your comorbidities. It, it, it can exacerbate whatever disease or issue you are suffering. And it can take you out by suicide because I, there's so many people who are only able to sleep you know, an hour or two or three a night. And you do enough of those in a row, people can become very unstable even the most put together person. And secondly, for those, I don't know if the, the, the full legalization to criminalization strategy uh, would work or not. I mean, I, it is a possible path, I think. Uh, but you guys got to, when people who say who scoff at it, you got to remember, even with this crisis of overdose deaths, alcohol still kills more people every year by huge numbers, more than marijuana and opioids combined in most cases. So it isn't as if we have no drug use in the United States. It's just one drug is okay, and the other drug is taboo. Hmm. Very few people smoke a joint and rob a liquor store. Just saying. And very people, uh, I think zero people die of marijuana, but that's, that's yeah. not the story. And of course, that being the case, marijuana is in many cases a good substitute for uh, the uh, the stronger drugs and has the same pain relieving characteristics, so the uh, the whole regulatory environment conspires to make it very very difficult to get good uh, pain relief without running afoul of a regulator somewhere or someplace. And we are going to run afoul of our clock. That is all the time we have. Thank you, gentlemen, for for being here with us today. I want to remind our audience that you can catch us at libertariancounterpoint.com and all of your favorite social media outlets. And to please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.